We could see no national boundaries, no vast gulfs or high walls dividing people. We who are interested in the security of democracy. As each side attempts to prove to the world the superiority of its position. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead because I've been to the mountaintop. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Hello and welcome to this virtual program on presidential leadership during the Cold War. I'm Stan Deaton with the Georgia Historical Society and it's our pleasure to partner on this program with the UVA Club of Savannah. This conversation is the first of three with esteemed University of Virginia faculty, part of the Georgia Historical Society's Georgia History Festival, which this year is focused on the 75th anniversary of the beginning of the Cold War. With me today is Dr. William Hitchcock, the William W. Corcoran Professor of History at the University of Virginia. Dr. Hitchcock is the author of several books on the Cold War, most recently, The Age of Eisenhower, America and the World in the 1950s, published in 2018 by Simon & Schuster. Will, welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Stan. Good to be with you. Looking forward to a conversation. Let's get right to it. Um, in surveying the 45 years of the Cold War and its impact, um, one could argue that it fundamentally changed the constitutional framework of the American government, um, that it was this period that saw the greater concentration of power in the president at the expense of the Congress, that more than ever in our history, because of the challenges of the Cold War, our national course is now set by the personality of the president. Would you agree with that? Well, yes, I would agree with that. And, and I think it's been, a, it's been characteristic of, the, of the, the presidency over the last uh, half century or more that it has significantly grown in, in scope and in power. And the Cold War had a great deal to do with that. You know, it's, it's funny, I'll think back to, uh, to the Second World War. Well, that must have been the moment when the American government became enormous, right? Well, in some ways the military did, but you think about the Roosevelt White House was tiny. The executive office was actually very small. So there's Roosevelt with literally half a dozen advisors, a couple of, a couple of leading military mm -hmm. officials, uh, George Marshall and others planning a global war with a tiny array of you know, personnel and, and bureaucracy. When Truman became president uh, upon Roosevelt's death, he is suddenly facing a global strategic challenge of dealing with the Cold War, winding down the Second World War, um, all of these problems that are besetting the United States, and he has no levers to pull. You know, it's the proverbial thing, like, who's really in charge? And Truman says, well, I'm in charge, but I'm not sure what levers or what buttons to push. And it is he and his advisors who begin to grapple with the problem of building up an infrastructure so that they can organize intelligence, so they can organize the relationship between the individual military services, which, had, which, which competed terribly with each other, which had terrible relations. So that he's trying to figure out what's the appropriate uh, infrastructure for civil military relations, what's the role of the intelligence community. We get the 1947 National Security Act that creates the CIA. Um, these are the stepping stones, but even so, Truman will wage the Cold War in the first couple of years, and indeed the Korean War, and he still has a relatively small bureaucracy. And of course, you know, the Delta just keeps on going. Um, in the Cold War, Eisenhower's White House was still pretty small, but he organized it around the National Security Council. Uh, his, uh, he used that instrument of power very effectively, and it would grow and grow. The Vietnam War had a huge impact on expanding it. But you mentioned Congress, and I, the, the one hitch in your, in your assessment, Stan, is that, is that in the wake of the Vietnam War and in the wake of the Nixon period, Congress does try to reassert control over the executive. And the mm -hmm. War Powers Act and the Church Committee hearings that investigate all kinds of abuses of the CIA, which come, come on in the 1970s, in the mid-70s, is an effort to try to claw back a little bit of that power that had been uh, really surrendered by Congress because of the Cold War consensus, uh, the Congress now is thinking, wait, the Cold War consensus got us into Vietnam. We need a little bit of that power back. But guess what? It doesn't hang on to that power. And I, we see this in the 1980s and indeed right up through the post-Cold War period and into the 9-11 period, the American public and the Congress typically, and indeed I think, you know, 
it's very frequent that they defer to the role of the president in setting foreign policy, setting national security policy. Uh, and I think, you know, I think we would all in theory like to have a little more balance, um, a little more give and take uh, in which Congress plays its supervisory role a bit more aggressively. Um, but often you'll have a part, the same party in the Congress and in the White House, and in which case they, are, they don't want to run afoul of each other. So Stan, your question is absolutely right. The, the, the course has been to, to strengthen the role of the presidency to the detriment of the supervisory role of the Congress. And you mentioned um, some of the agencies that grew up after World War II. Um, I, I think the second big thing you could say about the Cold War is that because of the conflict, the intelligence establishment, right, the CIA, the National Security Council, the Pentagon have far more money and power, far less oversight uh, than any other bureaucratic agencies, perhaps, and that they have played an outsized role since 1945 in directing American foreign policy. Um, much of it perhaps without the public's knowledge. And so I would ask if you think that's true, but also what role did President Eisenhower play in that? He's the first two-term president of the Cold War, cast a long shadow, as you know, uh, your great book, which, you, which our audience can see behind you over your right shoulder. Um, you're sort of recast. You ask people to think differently about the Eisenhower presidency. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Well, um, you know, on the on the question of the CIA, Eisenhower, I think it's one of his one of the things that he carries over from the Second World War era. I think is the belief that you got to use whatever t tools you have at your at your disposal to to wage war against the bad guys. In the Second World War, he took advantage of intelligence. He took advantage of covert operations. He took advantage of the resistance movements on the continent working against Hitler. So in the Cold War, it's easier for him to connect the two and to say, well, we're waging a global Cold War against the Soviet Union. They're the bad guys. I want to know what they're doing. I want their secrets. I want intelligence on them. And I'm happy to use covert operations if it will help our global struggle in the Cold War. So I think, you know, we know we know in retrospect that that's going to lead to an unfortunately an abuse of the of the role of the CIA, I believe, over time. Mm -hmm. But in the 50s, Ike's view was the CIA is a very valuable tool that I can use to constrain Soviet power and also to wage war on the cheap and maybe even secretly so that I can avoid an overt you know, conflict with boots on the ground. So Eisenhower is quite enamored of secret power of the, of the growth of the CIA. Now, unfortunately, his choice of, you know, the, or the, the man who is, is, is gonna lead the CIA throughout his tenure was Alan Dulles. And I think Alan Dulles was a, was a, quite honestly, I think Alan Dulles did a great deal of damage. And I think he did it to the country and I think he did it to Eisenhower's presidency. I think he was a poor choice. I understand why he was uh, chosen. Uh, he had certain gifts. He had a legacy in the, in the war years himself of build, building intelligence networks in Europe. But he was so secretive. He was so, um, uh, he, he, he amassed a great deal of power. He talked about supervision. He, he was a clever bureaucratic infighter. He didn't allow any of the blue ribbon panels that were supposed to supervise the CIA to get anywhere near him. And, and he also persuaded Eisenhower to take a number of risks that in retrospect, I think were ill, Ill judged. So um, yes, yeah, so Eisenhower, that's one of the faults that I talk a lot about in my book about Ike. I do want to say, though, that on balance, the, the Eisenhower you know, foreign relations and national security is, is a record of significant success. And even though the CIA dimension of it is a real series of real black marks, what Eisenhower managed to do is to come into office in 1953 at a moment of extraordinary fluidity and difficulty and explosiveness in the Cold War. Korean War is going on. The Indochina War, the French Vietnam War is going on. There's a very nasty conflict brewing between China and the US over Taiwan. China had just gone communist in 1949. The nationalists were set up in Taiwan, which the Americans backed. That could explode at any moment. There was the Berlin problem. The city of Berlin was, how are we gonna deal with that? Americans, the Soviets, British and French were all in Berlin claiming to have access to it, but that was a flashpoint. Eisenhower has to deal with all of these things in addition to the growing Soviet threat because they're developing new missiles and new technology all the time. So people have an idea that Ike had it easy. The 50s was a relatively peaceful time. Don't believe a word of it. Uh, it was a very dangerous era uh, 
And I, I, I believe that we don't give Ike enough credit for doing the things that presidents have to do every day, which is to manage crises. You know, it's all well and good to say, well, I waged and won a war. Well, all right, that's, that's Eisenhower certainly did that. But managing the crises so that they don't become uh, worse is actually a huge part of the Cold War presidency. And I think Eisenhower managed to do that very well, staying out of Indochina. Uh, he did use nuclear threats on, in Taiwan of, with, with, with China, but nonetheless managed to avoid serious uh, expansion of conflicts, which the American public were very grateful for because they hated the Korean War. They were delighted that he got out of the Korean War in 1953. They had been at war since 1941. Mm -hmm. The country did not want that kind of conflict and Eisenhower gave them peace, um, which they desperately wanted after a decade of conflict. Before I go any further, uh, I should ask our uh, tell our audience that uh, if as you're listening to this, if you have questions, if there's something that sparks your interest that you want to know more about, please submit those. When we get to the end of the program, Will and I will take your questions. Um, will, I want to quote from your book because you mentioned presidential crises, that there's sort of a moment of truth there with presidents. Um, and you have written, and I quote here, presidents always confront crises they do not foresee and often do not understand. It is then that history is best able to take the measure of the man, unquote. So, and we can think of many such moments uh, for the Cold War presidents, uh, for Truman, perhaps the Soviet blockade of Berlin, uh, for JFK, of course, the most famous, the Cuban Missile Crisis, for Carter, the Iranian hostage crisis, um, what moment would you point to for Eisenhower, we'll stay with him for a moment, perhaps that tested him in this way as perhaps nothing else did? Well, Stan, as you will know, because you have the book in front of you, I, I wrote that about a domestic crisis that was going on in the United States during the Cold War, which actually is relevant to the Cold War, which, which was the civil rights movement and the civil rights a challenge. And Eisenhower was not prepared to deal with the emergence of a nationwide civil rights movement. And he wasn't quite, he, he was not um, comfortable dealing with those policy issues. He had very little experience and the, the black experience in uh, the United States of the 50s, but he had to deal with um, uh, with changes in the country that he didn't understand. So, so he relied upon very talented uh, subordinates, in, 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 in his case, the Attorney General Herbert Brownell, who guided Eisenhower through the thickets of the civil rights uh, problems of the 50s guided him in a very progressive way. We, you know, we get all sorts of uh, changes, the Brown versus Board decision of the Supreme Court, the appointment of Earl Warren, of course, um, the Little Rock incident of 1957 in which Eisenhower decides to use the federal troops to, uh, to, to allow black mm -hmm. students at Little Rock High School. So that's a Cold War crisis that was a part of, it was related to the Cold War in part because it was such an embarrassment on the international stage. America's Jim Crow policies were a terrible embarrassment. And Eisenhower knew this because embassies across Europe and across the world would constantly write into the president and say, you know, you ought to know that in, 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 uh, in, in, in Europe and France or in Germany, they, they, they think that McCarthyism and, and Jim Crow are terrible uh, embarrassments for the United States. And it undercuts your moral authority to lead the West in the Cold War. You should do something about it. So that's an interesting way in which the domestic policy and the Cold War policy became knitted together. So that's an example of a domestic crisis that has an international dimension that Eisenhower had to, had to face. I think another example, um, you know, Ike was very good on national security policy. He had seen every conceivable crisis during the Second World War, but the Sputnik crisis was a big one for him. He anticipated that there was going to be breakthroughs on the Soviet side, but it was a public relations nightmare for the United States that the Soviets got a satellite into space first in 1957. And, and, and really, it, Eisenhower handled it, initially handled it rather poorly. He wasn't quite sure what to do. The Soviets had beat the United States. Everyone could see that. So how do you, how do you spin that? And the way that he spun it was, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. And that's not at all what, uh, what that didn't work. He came back about a month later and he said, look, I'll grant you that they beat us, but it doesn't really matter in terms of the, the balance. We're way ahead of them on, on technology. We're gonna get a satellite up into space, which they did a couple months later. And after that, that, the embarrassment eased, but it was just a sign that technological breakthroughs can be one of those moments when everyone is counting uh, the relative prestige of, of the two, two superpowers where there can be a sudden embarrassment. 
And of course, you mentioned many other crises that we could dig into if you like. Sure. Let, let's go back just for a moment before we skip right over him. You mentioned him uh, at the beginning, Harry Truman. Uh -huh. um, where would you place him uh, in the pantheon of, of Cold War presidents? He was not highly regarded at the time. He went out of office with very low approval ratings. The man who lost China uh, to communism, uh, who let the Soviets develop the bomb on his watch, who got us into supposedly the Korean conflict, couldn't get us out. Um, but he's risen in stature since. Why do you think that is so? Well, Harry Truman um, got really lucky in this sense is that David McCullough wrote a great biography about him, which <laughs> is still widely read. And, and any president would, you know, would, ought to be, anyone who wants to be president should be going to David McCullough and say, will you please write my biography? Because he wrote a great book about Truman that took, took Truman and gave us a rounded picture of the man. And what he showed was Truman's true essence, that he was a man of the people, that he was a Midwesterner, that he had, he had been a public servant, he had, he had fought in the First World War, that he'd gone into politics, that he, that he had an earthiness, a quality, an, an attractive quality about him. And once he, he was able to draw the character so colorfully, one became much more able to sympathize with the difficulties that Truman faced in the White House. I mean, the first thing to recall is, is, is just what you, you're talking about shocks. What is it like when you're the vice president and the president dies? and you get that call. And when the president is Franklin Roosevelt and the Second World War is still going on, what do you suppose was going through his mind? And McCullough does a really good job of, of, of pulling out um, that, that moment of shock. And you know, Truman himself would later say, I felt that the moon and the stars had all fallen on me. You know, he felt the world had just pivoted and he was now, he was now in charge. But it's, it was his great achievement to find his balance pretty quickly and to say, look, um, it's, it's the next man up, you know, one foot in front of the other, et cetera. He had a kind of a, a pragmatism about him that didn't, that, so that he was able to fill the role quite quickly. You ask about his, you know, how, how do Cold War historians feel about him? And I, I, and I think the, the answer is it's, it's an ambiguous judgment. On the one hand, uh, he, he, he engineered and his advisors, Marshall, Atchison and others, he created the infrastructure that would essentially allow the United States to win the Cold War, if you like. I mean, the Marshall Plan, NATO, the NATO alliance, the institutions of the Western alliance that brought the US into European affairs on a permanent basis, which it's still there. We're still in Europe and that's a good thing. It gave, a, a, it created a community of interests, a community of security so that the Cold War would remain cold, unlike the First World War, which had drifted into the Second World War. So just in terms of their achievements of identifying the common interests of the West and building a, a community of interests through the Marshall Plan and NATO, I think you, you, have, to, you have to say that Truman was one of the most consequential uh, leaders of the Cold War era altogether. On the other hand, there's a great deal of evidence to suggest that Truman oversimplified and overreacted and that he perhaps brought about the Cold War to begin with. Now, I'm not saying that's my view, but there's a great deal of literature, a great deal of very thoughtful uh, scholarship that suggests that Truman did, it, did as much as Stalin did, maybe even more, to bring about the worsening of US-Soviet relations that Roosevelt had tried so hard to, to keep together, and that he um, was not particularly sophisticated in his reading of Soviet insecurity, Soviet weaknesses. He, everything he saw was Soviet threats, Soviet dangers. And, and I think there's some merit to that. Um, and I think that uh, you know, part of it is, is, is that the domestic politics of being anti-communist were very, very powerful, very, um, you know, it, it forced his hand to some extent. So the, 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 long, the, the long run is that it's a, it's, a, it's a mixed legacy, but it's an enormously consequential one. And, and I also believe that Truman was as honest and as transparent a figure uh, as, as we've had it in the White House. And so that alone is, is comforting. So that whether you disagree or agree with his decisions, you can always track them down. I'll just add one more thing before we move on. Sure. Because really does bear uh, on the whole story of the Cold War. Truman is the only president still to have, to have uh, dropped two atomic bombs. And now that's another factor that um, has, has attracted a great deal of attention in, uh, from scholars. Was it the right thing to do? Um, uh, there is a debate and that debate has gone on. And it will continue to go on. 
maybe the first bomb was the right thing to do. Maybe the second was the wrong thing to do. Maybe both were right. Maybe not. Maybe both were wrong. How did it change America's standing in the world? What did it mean for the presidency that now the president of the United States, a single person, had that kind of power at his fingertips? And now today, of course, infinitely greater power. It changed world politics. And so, you know, Truman said he never lost a night's sleep over it. I find that hard to believe. But at the same time, it gives you a sense for what kind of man he was, that he was able to make such a consequential decision without losing uh, too many nights sleep over it. And the nuclear threat, of course, is what really defines the Cold War, a, a threat that continues um, to hang over the United States, although we don't feel it in the same way now because we're not in the midst of a Cold War. But let's take that then one step further to, the, to Eisenhower. You wrote and I quote here again from your book, between 1945 and 1961, no persons dominated American public life more than Eisenhower. Eisenhower expanded the power and scope of the 20th century warfare state and put into place a long-term strategy designed to wage and win the Cold War, unquote. So describe, if you will, what you mean by expanding the warfare state and what was the strategy? If Truman set laid the foundation for the agencies that would carry out the Cold War. You give Eisenhower, I think, the credit for ultimately setting in place the strategy that ultimately won it. Describe for our audience what that was. Well, put simply, it was peace through strength. And Eisenhower did build out the infrastructure to wage the Cold War. And by that, I mean, it was in the Eisenhower period, 53 to 1961, that the, the tools were actually designed and built uh, uh, to, to, to contain Soviet power and to deter the Soviets. So I'm talking about the nuclear, the nuclear infrastructure. You know, in the Eisenhower period, they designed and tested and, and deployed thousands of new missiles with initially short range, then longer range, and finally intercontinental range. So, uh, so that nuclear weapons could be, could be delivered to any point in on the world. That occurred deliberately during the Eisenhower period. Eisenhower also uh, oh, super, supervised the construction of the, the, the triad. So we had uh, nuclear missiles, we had the submarine missiles, the Polaris missiles that could be carried under sea. Those went, uh, went live in 1960. And also uh, the aircraft, with, uh, intercontinental bombers, which, could, which circled the globe 24 hours a day carrying nuclear warheads. In addition to which Eisenhower took the first steps to militarize space by placing the first spy satellite uh, in, in, in orbit, um, which could take photographs actually on film and then drop them very cumbersome, drop them uh, uh, through the atmosphere to be collected by an aircraft. So Eisenhower created this infrastructure not because he wanted or expected that he would use it, but because he figured this was the best way to deter Soviet threats, to deter Soviet challenges, and to deliver a clear message that America was prepared to use its nuclear power if necessary. He hoped it would never be necessary. But I have come to the conclusion by studying Eisenhower very carefully for a long period of time that he would have used nuclear weapons, probably some of the smaller scale nuclear weapons, had it come, uh, had he felt it was absolutely necessary. I don't, like Harry Truman, I think he would have said, it has to be done, especially in the case of US-China relations, because in the Eisenhower period, China didn't have the ability to respond with a nuclear weapon. So mm -hmm. I do think there was a, that that's a factor. Um, but you know, the other, but the other piece of this, so that's the strength piece of it. The other piece is that Eisenhower avoided conflict. He, sought, he, he extended the hand of peace uh, to the Soviets. In 1955, he meets Nikita Khrushchev. In, in, in 1959, Khrushchev comes to the United States. I enjoyed writing about that visit, which is full of comedy. Uh, you know, Khrushchev coming to, to, to Washington and then going all across the country, goes all the way out to California. He goes to Hollywood. He sees Shirley MacLaine making the movie Can Can, and it's, a, it's an international incident because it's so risque. He eats hot dogs. He goes to a cornfield and sees American corn. What's happening here is the Americans are domesticating Khrushchev. They're making him less scary. They're making him feel, making him you know, appear to be normal and human. Eisenhower embraced all of that. He wanted to defuse the Cold War. So you get the results that we avoid uh, a major conflict. We avoid uh, troops overseas in the Eisenhower period. Yes, there's the covert operations. But also final point, Eisenhower does this without uh, destroying the economic balance of the country. During the Eisenhower period, uh, he is able to balance three budgets. Um, he comes close on the others. Uh, 
He does spend significant sums on the military, but not at the expense of blowing up the federal budget, like, for example, Ronald Reagan would do. So if I told you that I could get you a president that gave you uh, eight years of peace, um, uh, was, uh, had 70% approval ratings, uh, would, um, you know, would, would pass progressive legislation on issues like civil rights and, and housing and uh, health and education, uh, infrastructure, uh, build super, super highways, um, and would somehow manage to get us out of an unpopular war um, all while balancing the budget. You know, I think I have just described a, a political unicorn, but that is the legacy of Eisenhower. Well, and, and it's, it, you go from there, of course, uh, you mentioned um, balanced budgets. Um, John F. Kennedy ran against Eisenhower claiming that they're not against Eisenhower, but against Richard Nixon, his vice president, claiming, of course, that there was a missile gap. And boy, got into, of course, what is arguably the greatest failure of the presidential leadership during the Cold War. And that is, of course, Vietnam. He and his vice president and then President Lyndon Johnson. It's easy now to look back at these two. Um, and either romanticize what JFK might have done had he lived uh, to prosecute or not that war. Um, and also, of course, to demonize LBJ for not being able to see into the future and know what we know looking back at Vietnam, that the domino theory didn't hold, that all those lives and treasure, and that in fact, Americans couldn't have guns and butter. Um, if you will talk a little bit about Vietnam um, as a failure of leadership, would you characterize it as that? Um, and is it fair to sort of uh, blame LBJ because we can look backwards? And, and would he, could he have made a different decision realistically? Yes, the answer is yes. Um, so the, but there's two individuals here that you mentioned, Kennedy and Johnson, and they're very different. And, and of course, one uh, was his presidency was tragically shortened and abbreviated. Um, the, Kennedy, the Kennedy plot line, in my view, is, is learning on the job. And he only had three years, so we could only project what he might have accomplished in eight years. But you get the young John Kennedy, who you 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 uh, you said ran against Eisenhower, and then you correct yourself. Oh, of course, he ran against Nixon, but you were right. He did run against Eisenhower in a sense. He ran against Ike because Ike was old. Ike was the previous generation. Ike was moderate. You know, he was dull. He was boring. Kennedy was young. He was dynamic. He was handsome. He ran against the Eisenhower record as a hawk. He, he said, you've done too little. Look, they have missile gap. Uh, you know, the communists have taken over in Cuba. You've done nothing. He tried to criticize Eisenhower for being soft. I mean, can you imagine running against Richard Nixon and saying you're soft on communism? Uh, Kennedy was, he was good. He was good. Um, anyhow, so he comes into office with full of beans and he feels like, I don't need to listen to the experts. I'm gonna run my own national security thing. I'm smarter than all these old bogeys. And the first thing he does is the catastrophe of the Bay of Pigs, a, a plan, scheme that was planned in the Eisenhower years, but executed April 61, and it blows up in his face. It's, and it's because he didn't really run the numbers. He didn't really think through this, um, this plan. He didn't see its flaws. But the, but the reality is, I think, he learns from that. And in the Cuban Missile Crisis, which will, which will come in October um, uh, the following year, what we see is a very different John Kennedy, somebody who is now starting to feel um, a sense of, of a confidence and of managing the crisis. And you know, imagine the difficulty. Suddenly, you wake up and they bring you the U2 slides and photographs, and they say that Khrushchev has put uh, has put uh, missiles in Cuba. What are you going to do about it? Very difficult problem to uh, to, to solve. So he 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 tackles it with uh, with mastery, with skill. Uh, he comes up with a plan to put pressure on uh, the, the, the Soviets to withdraw those missiles, but it's a face-saving negotiation. It's a face-saving deal in which the Soviets will withdraw those missiles, and secretly Kennedy will give them a similar deal, which is the withdrawal of some American missiles in Turkey. But the public doesn't know that, so it looks as if he's, been, he's gone eyeball to eyeball and he made the, the Soviets blink, but in fact he negotiated a way out. So, that's a clue to where he might have gone. Now, you know, we all know that, that he increased Soviet advisors in Vietnam. Does that mean Kennedy would have waged the Vietnam War the way Lyndon Johnson waged it? I do not think that's the case. We don't know exactly how he would have handled the challenge in Vietnam, but I don't think he would have sent half a million soldiers there. It just doesn't feel right to me. 
Johnson is the character who is the great tragic figure here, the gifted legislate, legislator, the Southern, Southerner who finally made it into the White House. But how did he come to office? He came to office through a tra national tragedy, Kennedy's assassination. So he spends the first year feeling the shadow of the Kennedys, knowing the country has not elected him. He's filling a dead man's shoes. And it, there's a lot of insecurity in that first year. And it's in that first year that he makes one of the most important decisions with respect to Vietnam, because there's the, 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 the Tonkin Gulf crisis in which some American ships claim they were fired on by Vietnamese uh, patrol boats, destroyer uh, uh, PT boats. And they, they claim that they've been struck. Maybe they were, maybe, maybe they weren't. Uh, but Johnson goes to the Congress and he says, I need a blank check because I'm gonna teach these communists a thing or two. I want you to support me on this. Uh, I, you have to give me a blank check to use whatever force I didn't deem desirable to deal with the communist threat. That's August of 1964. His ratings go through the roof. The Congress is unanimous behind him. Johnson's suddenly feeling great. He gets a landslide victory in November of 64. And you'd think, boy, he's got it all. And he squanders this great gift of national unity, national consensus. He pushes through all of this transformational social legisla legislation that he's, he's, that he's wanted to do, the Great Society, Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act. And then he decides that the United States has to, has to go to war in Vietnam to protect American credibility. Oh boy, that's what I call it to my students, that's the C word, credibility. It's the great, it's the great myth, it's the great mistake, it's the great trap of the Cold War, Johnson falls right into it. And here's what I'll just, I'll just to finish on this, Dan, I know I'm going on too long, but I, yeah. I want to address this point. The scholars who have written carefully about Johnson's decisions to go to war have told us, have reminded us that nobody was pressuring Johnson to go to war in 1965 in Vietnam at, at such a scale. Yes, it was, Vietnam was a problem, but could it have been managed differently? Of course it could have. The American allies were not pressing America to, 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 to begin a huge conventional war in Vietnam. The Soviets weren't doubting American credibility in 1965. Um, the, the American public, the American Congress was not begging Johnson to get into a major conventional war in Southeast Asia. Johnson made the decision himself. And it was a tragic decision because it once so many hundreds of thousands of Americans were committed there, then it would become next to impossible to extract them. It destroyed his presidency. The war destroyed the Cold War consensus. It ripped the country apart as a younger generation of college students went out into the streets and, and for the first time in the Cold War, turned their back on their government and said, We're, you, we think you're lying. We think you're wrong. You have lost the moral authority. So America's credibility was worse after four years of Vietnam uh, than, it, than it had been at the beginning. And that's why Johnson finally recognized he'd failed and he did not run for reelection. I could go on, but you get the point. It's a tragic story that I think our contemporary students, my students at University of Virginia today need to study much more carefully. The Vietnam War is still a, a, a rich subject for lessons about leadership and failures of leadership and reading the signals incorrectly, maybe hubris uh, you know, ego is also a, a, a topic we could study in looking at Johnson's decisions in Vietnam. Hmm. So you don't think he was correct in in um, his fear that domestically the Republicans would hang on him, what they had hung on Truman, that he was there, it was on his watch that the uh, that China fell to the communists, the idea that all of Southeast Asia was going to go to the communists. And, and, you know, as LBJ would have said, by God, not on my watch. You don't think that that's a, that really was uh, a consideration, or it was a consideration, but he could have pushed that aside. That's what I'm saying. I, of course, it was a consideration, and and uh, and Johnson worried very much about the loss of China uh, problem that had uh, that had so hampered um, uh, so hampered Truman, um, mm -hmm. and it and it could have been a polit politically difficult problem to handle. I, I'm not suggesting um, that there weren't going to be consequences of uh, of walking away from from Southeast Asia. But Johnson was a damn good politician and he could have persuaded the American public and he could have built a, cons a, a coalition uh, in his party to say, we're not going to wage World War III in Southeast Asia because we're already doing pretty well there. Look, we've got, we've got South Korea going, we've got Japan going, we've got the Philippines going, we're containing China and Taiwan, we're doing fine in Asia, we, we don't need this fight. And I think he could have made that case to the American public. 
it, it really is a tragic story. And um, let's move ahead a little bit. Um, I, we're going to, for a moment, jump over the ultimate Cold War era and Richard Nixon and his presidency and his relations with China and the Soviet Union, because I do want to get right to Ronald Reagan. I want to talk about him. He's He, I think, is, is especially for this latter generation, is the, the president, I think, most associated, at least, um, with the end of the Cold War, even though it didn't happen right on his watch. Um, he, he's the president, of course, who told Gorbachev to tear down this wall in Berlin. He's often credited with winning the Cold War. Do you think that's true? Uh, and do you think that he is, uh, and maybe I know the answer to this and I should phrase it differently. Do you think that he is maybe the most important Cold War president? Well, I'm gonna break, a, I'm gonna break the hearts of at least half the audience here because the answer to that question is no. Ronald Reagan does not get credit for ending the Cold War. I'm sorry, you heard it, you heard it here first, and I'm sure people are clicking off their Zoom right now. But, but, let, but hear me out, hear me out. That's not to take credit away from him. He played a crucial role. He played a crucial role in the winding down of the Cold War, and I want to stress this. It used to be said that Reagan came into office a super duper hawk and that he turned into a dove. You know, there was a Reagan reversal. A lot of people said he changed his mind and became, he wanted to have a legacy of, of peace and so on. That's actually not really true. A lot of scholars lately have shown us that that's not quite right. Uh, he came, Reagan came into office as a hawk and he left office as a hawk, but he also came into office as an idealist. He was a truly idealistic person who wanted to end the Cold War. He thought the Cold War was immoral. He wanted to get rid of nuclear weapons. He was a nuclear abolitionist. And in that sense, he actually had quite a lot in common with some of the, the hippies in America and in Europe that were also calling for an end to nuclear weapons. So this is what makes Reagan so compelling is that he, he brings together some things that we don't often find. Yes, he was, he was a cold warrior and he built up the defense establishment considerably, but he was genuinely interested in seeking a breakthrough in US-Soviet relations. And he felt that, that he somehow, you know, he, he believed it deeply that the Soviets somehow would surely want to, want to embrace the notion that you could transcend the Cold War. Now, the reason that I say he doesn't get the credit for ending the Cold War is because without Mikhail Gorbachev in power from 1985 onward, Reagan wouldn't have had a partner to work with. He could have had all the ideas in the world that he wanted, but it wouldn't have gone anywhere if Andropov or Chernyenko had, had lived. No, they didn't, and Gorbachev came in. And it was Gorbachev who was the radical. Gorbachev was the innovator. He was the risk taker. He took all the risks in the world leading to the complete collapse of his country and his own destruction, politically speaking. But it was he who reached out to Reagan because he needed something, which was a, 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 an easing of the Cold War so that he could reform socialism in the Soviet Union. So Gorbachev and Reagan made a, the, the proverbial odd couple. But what's interesting is that they read each other in a, in, a, in a moment of history where Soviet weaknesses were really the key thing that both sides understood. So Soviet economy was falling apart. The Soviets had intervened in Afghanistan in 1979. That was a fiasco. Uh, of course, you get the Chernobyl incident uh, in the middle, in the early in the Gorbachev years. You know, the Soviet Union is swirling the drain and both sides are able to see that they have a vested interest in doing something together to reduce at least nuclear weapons. And here Reagan's idealism comes back. Maybe we could get rid of them all. And Gorbachev and Reagan are sitting at the table in Reykjavik and Reagan say, hey, why don't we get rid of them all? And the advisors are thinking, good God, no, that's a terrible idea. And, <laughs> and besides that, Reagan won't give up the one thing that, that he, he is, his, is his, uh, his, great, his great idea, which is the famous Strategic Defense Initiative or Star Wars, as it was uh, mocking. Mm -hmm. But this was a technological idea. It was, you know, in theory, could shoot down missiles and create a bubble around the United States. And 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 uh, Gorbachev said, "You got to get rid of that, or else we can't negotiate." So the negotiations uh, come to naught. But in in 1987, you get the first great big breakthrough, which is the INF or Inter Intermediate Nuclear Forces Agreement. And I, I just want to remind folks, you know, this was this was a huge deal. Uh, the idea that you could have a a human personal connection with a Soviet general secretary in Mikhail Gorbachev came to the US and met people and seemed like a young, intelligent European, and that you could go and, 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 and rip open the heart of the Cold War and say, let's get rid of a whole class of weapons, of nuclear weapons. What a great thing that would be. So Reagan leaves office having accomplished an enormous amount in terms of bringing the two sides, sort of put it, if you like, putting both the US and the Soviet Union on the same railway tracks, you know, in the direction of history which was that the Cold War was changing, it was softening, it was, it was kind of falling apart. 
And I do think he gets credit for that. It, it's often said, oh, Reagan spent, the, spent so much money on the Cold War that he, 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 he forced the Soviets to, to give in. I think, that's a, I think that's a caricature of a much more humane process in which Reagan's idealism and his good fortune, his luck, actually served to uh, unwind the Cold War, or at least begin to unwind it. Sounds like your next biography needs to be Ronald Reagan. Uh, um, well, you know, I'll tell you, <laughs> the first person I voted for was in 1984, for president, first presidential election I voted for, and I voted for Fritz Mondale. And you know what happened to Fritz Mondale. He lost <laughs> the 49 states, I think. Uh, so in, I, indeed. You know, that was my introduction to how popular Reagan was in the 80s. Um, and, we, and we could certainly play what if here and go back through some of these elections and talk about what might have happened if the loser had become president. But I want to, before we start taking some questions from our audience, I want to ask another big picture uh, question here. As you mentioned, you mentioned, talked about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Perhaps the scariest moment in the Cold War was in October 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And JFK is often given very high marks for his temperate, cool leadership, supposedly during that crisis. Now, I talked to former U.S. Senator Sam Nunn two weeks ago, and he gives all the presidents, from Truman to George H.W. Bush, credit for their restraint in not launching a nuclear war, not uh, whether on purpose or, as he thought, even more likely by accident um, over the 45-year period while dealing with the Soviet Union and other threats uh, to the U.S. across 45 years. You wrote, talking about Ike, quote, there would be many sincere words of peace during his presidency, but Ike was always preparing for war, unquote. Now that to me sums up what being president during the Cold War era was really all about. Would you agree with that? Or do you think Ike stands alone in that regard? Oh, I, uh, well, I think that's the job of the president. And, and, but I'm not sure that, that every single one of them has done it as well um, or, or has taken that role as seriously as they should. Um, but I don't think any of us, I mean, Sam Nunn is probably as close to, to uh, as possible to who might, might be able to tell us, but I don't know that any of us who haven't been inside the White House or who haven't served as president could imagine what that's like. The notion that you know uh, you've, you've got the ability, the nuclear codes are always right, right with you. That you have the ability to launch a nuclear a strike. Um, that it's your judgment, your judgment alone, that is going to decide when these weapons could be used. But also that that there is in waiting a gigantic network, a gigantic world circling infrastructure of destruction that you can activate with the push of a button. Uh, what what human wouldn't be overwhelmed or overawed by that pressure? Um, so when I say that Ike was always preparing for war, I think that that is the role of the president to anticipate. You know, Eisenhower, having been a a, a military officer. Um, was very good at war plans and war gaming. And he thought a lot about strategic problems in, in the hypothetical. I actually believe that in general, it's probably not so good to have military folks in the civilian uh, world, but in this one area of thinking ahead, looking, imagining what's around the corner, doing exercises to simulate what might happen if X occurred, what, how would we react? That's the kind of training that many, many advisors, you know, need to have before they can go in to help the president think through problems. Um, and I think Ike brought that with him. Uh, you know, John Kennedy didn't have that kind of experience when he first entered office, but, but acquired it very quickly, just because I think he was an enormously intelligent man who was good at, 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 at that, kind of, that kind of imagining, you know, if X, then Y, how do I respond? So as he's working through the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, the 13 days, he's constantly interrogating his, his advisors. The advisors say, you know what you should do, Mr. President, you should, you should invade Cuba right now. And that's what the military initially said. And then he says, all right, walk me through what happens next. And by the time they get to World War III, he says, okay, we're not doing that. You know, so he, he's constantly pushing his advisors to say, you, you can't just tell me the first move, you have to give me the next five moves. And, and, it's, and it's in that process that he eliminates the most dangerous options, which, you know, bombing, invasion of ground invasion or just bombing some of the site the missile sites themselves what we now know what they didn't know at the time was that the soviets had a wide array of nuclear weapons in cuba had the americans invaded on a ground and amphibious invasion those weapons would have been fired at the american troops coming on coming into uh, into to land we would have had a nuclear exchange at the, in the first few minutes of an american invasion so kennedy very just instinctively knew that that was a dangerous move and avoided it 
the more we look at the Cuban Missile Crisis, the more you come away thinking it was this close to, to genuine nuclear exchange, but also what a gift it was to have a, a president at that moment who, who just had a, a kind of an instinct that there was a way out. There was a negotiated settlement here and he kept going until he got it. And, and uh, it, he, he deserves the credit, I think, that he, 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 he gets for managing uh, his, the country's way out of that. Um, taking a question from our audience, we have a viewer who asked what your assessment is of Eisenhower's military industrial complex speech, one oh. of his most famous as he left office. Yeah, thank you for asking that. That's a wonderful question. It's a puzzle, isn't it? You know, here is the, the great military leader and then the guy who, who does so much to build the Cold War infrastructure and he leaves office by saying, hey, by the way, watch out for the military industrial complex. It might take over your government. Yeah, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a head of a, you know, uh, your, your head is swiveling a little bit. But what he was really saying, if you read the speech from start to finish, is he was saying the Cold War is a tragedy. And we're very sorry that it has happened, but it has happened. And in order so that we can protect American interests and American allies and, and as he would put it, freedom, we have had to build a, this huge military infrastructure. It is the role, he then went on to say, it's the role of the president to control that military infrastructure. And so what he's doing is he is saying to the American public, you, American public, have got to hold your leaders accountable so that they don't get overcome, intimidated by the brass, intimidated by the Pentagon, so that they don't fall a prey to the lure of, uh, of, of war or of, of prestige or, or foolish uh, uh, overseas interventions. I believe, this is my reading uh, of it, is that this is a bit of a warning to John Kennedy. And it's a bit of a chastising of the American public for electing John Kennedy, who Eisenhower believed at the time did not have the experience to be president. So what he's saying is, watch out, you've just elected this 43 year old, you know, good luck, good luck with that. Uh, what, what, you know, you have to hold your leaders accountable to keep the Cold War cold. Don't let them fall under the spell of the military. And I think that comes from a lifetime of him knowing that the generals are always going to try to winkle out of you more money and more more uh, more weapon systems if they can. Mm -hmm. uh, with the presidential election coming up in just a couple of weeks, um, I want to ask you about uh, the effect of the Cold War on presidential politics and really what's happened since the Cold War ended for for more than 40 uh, 40 years, Americans running for president promised, right? The first thing they had to do was promise to stand up to the Soviets, to be to be firm against communism and the spread of it anywhere in the world. Um, calling your opponent soft on communism was uh, an election year ritual every four years. A after the end of the Cold War, we lost that unifying external threat to be replaced with all sorts of other things, terrorism, globalism, immigration, whatever the case may be. How has the end of the Cold War affected American presidential politics and have we perhaps forgotten we tend to romanticize partisanship in the past have we over romanticized partisanship during the cold war because it seems that we were awfully divided then too but that's two questions first is how has the end of the cold war affected presidential politics let's say since 1992 and into the present yeah well i mean i think that i think one of the ways in which the cold war uh changed, you might say even warped American politics, is that it, 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 it created a, a framework in which we understood America's place in the world as fighting bad guys. Not as just being a normal state with friends, maybe some friends, maybe some enemies, but basically kind of worrying about itself mostly. But it created the notion that America's proper role in the world was a global one and that we would have an opinion about every single conflict all over the world, and that we would find allies and identify the enemy. So the Cold War gave us this, I think, somewhat warped vision of our place in the world as the center, the only, the only bastion of freedom in a dangerous world. And once that was gone in, in 1989, 1990, there was a brief moment, you, you'll recall this, there was a brief moment in which we talked about a new world order in which maybe we would, we would cease you know, this kind of constant rivalry and a nuclear arms race and that we would, we would beat our swords into plowshares. There'd be a peace dividend. 
And I think what happened was Americans didn't have, maybe didn't have long enough or maybe didn't have the, the creativity to, to stick with that plan. And so once the threat of global terrorism emerged, and it was already lurking there in the late 80s, but it really becomes a problem in the 1990s, the, 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 the first attack on the World Trade Center in 1993, but also uh, the rise of, uh, of rogue states in, 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 uh, in the Middle East um, that, that may be dangerous in some way. They started to serve the same function of being a monster that we had to corral and contain. Some would say that was the appropriate thing to do because they, they presented a threat to us. But others would say that was the old, you know, replacing one global enemy for another because that was the way Americans were used to seeing themselves in the world. My own view is that since 9-11, um, we, uh, we have really um, fallen into a very regrettable a posture around the world, which is we, we have we expanded American, uh, the security apparatus on such an enormous scale of fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq. You know, I would just ask the audience to ask themselves, are we safer and more secure around the world uh, after almost 20 years of conflict uh, in, in, uh, in, in Afghanistan? And of course, a little less in Iraq, but nonetheless, um, and in addition to which we have been waging a war on terror around the world nonstop. Has it worked? Have, are, we, uh, are, we, are we as secure as we could be? Yes, it's true. We have not had a 9-11 event and thank God for that. So maybe the answer is absolutely, we are more, more secure. I know many good people who, who, who believe that and who have participated in that policy, uh, but, but the costs are real. I mean, every, uh, we know the costs are, are real. We don't have the kind of civil liberties that we would like. Uh, we have a, a surveillance uh, apparatus that has, that has uh, you know, been created. Um, the government knows more about us than it has ever known, and it can control uh, much of our um, personal data and so forth. So, you know, the, the reality is that, that you might look back at the Cold War and say, we had the balance better then than we do now in terms of the size and scale of the national security state. And that's something you would not have predicted when the Cold War ended in, in 1989. For sure. Um, this may be our last question. We have a few minutes left. And because we're the Georgia Historical Society, I have to ask you, where do you put Jimmy Carter in, cold, in the Cold War? What role did he play, good or bad, and how do you rate him? That's a tough one. Um, I admire Jimmy Carter enormously, and I think his post-presidency has been a model in some ways um, for what uh, public figures uh, who are out of office can do. He has been a leading humanitarian um, his, he's a man of integrity, um, a man of extraordinary longevity. Um, but it's no shame to, to say, it's no, it's no, uh, I don't, it, it, there's no, um, no, no harshness in a judgment, but I think he, he, he was overmatched by the events of the, of, of the late seventies. And, and I think, I think many presidents would have been, um, he, he was, he was overwhelmed by a changing world. Uh, the seventies was a, a decade of enormous upheaval in terms of uh, global economics, uh, in terms of the rise of all kinds of new threats in the Middle East, handling the Soviet uh, uh, questions in Afghanistan, and the, the return, the, the leaving of detente, and the return to the Cold War after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. That was something he did not expect and was, in a sense, sort of, you know, he wanted to be the peacemaker. He wanted to be the human rights president. He wound up taking us back into the, into the freeze of the Cold War. And of course, he was overwhelmed by the, the Iran hostage crisis in which the, the, the revolutionary government in, in Tehran seized American hostages. I'll just say on a personal note, my father was in the Foreign Service and in 1977, he asked to be assigned to Tehran. He did not mm. get his first choice. His second choice was Tel Aviv. So he went to Tel Aviv. I went to Tel Aviv with my dad and we, I lived in Israel for four years in the late 70s. And it was a wonderful time. The man who got the job was a hostage for the entire time. So, you know, it's just one of those little moments, a little shift of the dial, and my life would have been very different. But um, that was an a, a, a outrageous, outrageous uh, a breach of, of international law and decorum that, that, um, that, that to this day should enrage every American. Um, and, and, you know, Carter was overwhelmed by it. And, and uh, it, it, we can find fault in maybe how he handled it, but um, it, it did, it, it did just par partially destroy his presidency. We have run out of time. We could talk for several more hours about presidential leadership during the Cold War. I, my thanks for our partner, the UVA Club of Savannah. William Hitchcock, thank you so much for coming on here. The book, 
which uh, he has right behind him, which I encourage everyone to read. It's called The Age of Eisenhower, America and the World in the 1950s, published by Simon & Schuster in 2018. Will, thanks so much for coming on. Dan, it was a real pleasure. Thank you so much. And, and I really, really enjoyed your excellent questions. Thank you.